Good morning. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to discuss Professor Edwards' paper. I think it's a very interesting, very uh, good review on the exchange policies. Uh, as we heard from yesterday's two keynote speeches by Lia Anna and Piru, Piru, that China and the emerging economies are increasingly um, linked to each other. And what happened in China has a lot of uh, impact on Peru, Chile, and many Latin American countries. So the Chinese exchange policy also will matter to, to these uh, emerging economies and uh, other countries. Uh, China not only has impact on uh, emerging economies, also has impact on developed countries like the Greenspan, the, the former governor of the Federal Reserve in the US argues that the excess savings in China depressed the local, global long-term interest rate, promote the housing bubble, and eventually uh, resulting the global financial crisis. So basically he blamed China to the current uh, financial cr uh, crisis. So I think it's very important to understand uh, why China has such a big uh, current account balance. So foreign exchange rate obviously this is one of the, the factor. But here, we result denying the, the importance of exchange policy. I want to expand Professor Edwards' um, line of argument a little bit to look at more in depth on China to see why China has saved so much. So I want to argue that in order to understand the large current account balance in China, we need to look at the demographic factors. I think that's a key uh, important driver for China's long-term uh, trade balances and uh, other also uh, macro uh, stabilities. So Chinese saving rate is extremely high in three senses. First, it had been relatively high than other countries, including its neighboring uh, East Asia countries. Chinese now is saving, uh, the, the national saving rate is over 50% now, has more than doubled uh, in the last uh, 30 decades. Along with the high savings rate, investment rate is also very high. The annual growth rate in fixed investment um, is about 20% to 30%, much higher than consumption uh, growth. So some people call China have a fixed investment uh, mania. So the key, key questions, why do the Chinese so, save so much? Uh, here I want to set a little bit of my own work published in an NBER working paper. So we argue it's related to China's uh, demographic tradition, one, um, the increasing sex ratio in China. So here in this table, the horizontal uh, uh, line is um, sex ratio rate uh, normalized by uh, divide, uh, subtracting the mean divided by standard error, and the vertical axis, axis is the uh, savings rate also normalized uh, by uh, uh, subtracting means and divided by standard error. You can see the two lines had almost exact co-movement. The correlation coefficient is high, as high as more than 0.82. At least this figure suggests some correlations between sex ratio at the birth 20 years ago and the current national savings rate. So in order to understand China's savings rate, we need to look at, also look at the, uh, the, the sex ratio balance. So why China has such a sex ratio imbalance? This mainly relates to the one-child policy. For the sex ratio, uh, the natural level is supposed to be 105 and 108. But now you look at the, the, the figure in the bottom, the, the sex ratio of birth is about every five boys to five girls. This means that going to the marriage age, 30 million Chinese men couldn't find wives. How big is that? It's bigger than the Italian, uh, all the male population in Italy, double the size of Vietnamese uh, men. So it's impossible to just rely on uh, marrying other women from neighboring countries. It's impossible. The, the population size is too big. So what's the, 
so this has a lot of consequence. We're all human beings. We know the girls like boys with money. You look at the McDonald's uh, some. You look at the last line. Only boys who save their pennies make me uh, rainy day. So I know how human beings, women want to marry men with wealth, with ban big bank account, with a large house. So for the families with sons react, are reacting to this. So this year's so-called Keep Up With The Jones. My name is one of the largest family names in the world. So it's Jones. So from an individual whose uh, point of view, so there's with increasing competition in the marriage market, so families must save more to attract mates for their sons. But this is a zero sum game. The total number of potential brides are fixed. So if everybody increase their savings, so you, you at the aggregate, le aggregate level, you create a social waste. So this not only happening for human beings, a human beings part of the na nature of the animal world. Darwin has a very famous theory called the sexual selection. So he found that he felt that the natural selection alone was unable to account for many types of apparently non-competitive adaptations, such as the, the tails of male peacock showing the figure. He commented that the sight of a feather in a peacock's tail, whenever I gaze at it, make me sick, because the tails is not good for survival. When predators come in, it's hard to fly, to escape. So only purpose is to attract female peacock. <laughs> so this universal is not only for peacock. If you look at the sea lions, look at the birds, in general, the males are bigger than females in terms of their size. Also, the males must fight to, to keep their territories, build bigger nice, etc. So human beings also have evolved. So you generally see men are bigger than men, uh, than women. So by now, the, we have become, come to the industrial society. I think that the wealth matters more. So this is why the, the, the size of the house matters. This is a photo taken from field in Guizhou province. So if you go there in the winter, you see a lot of construction everywhere, like this line. They're not building one story, two story, three day houses but it totally was a waste for three reasons. First of all, almost all the young men, young women have migrated out. They only come home for the Chinese New Year for two weeks. So to build a house, most of the time, is just a symbol for status. Secondly, there are no housing market in rural areas because the, the housing are not allowed to sell because the land belongs to the collective, not, collectives, not to the individual household. Thirdly, in these remote areas, 15 years, 50 years down the road, I would guess it would be largely depopulated, more like the Middle West in the US, because such remote areas, agriculture doesn't have much potentials. So despite this kind of disadvantage, the, uh, obvious low returns, but people still put a lot of money, a lot of uh, uh, valuable uh, resources from remittance to this kind of wasteful environment on the housing. So th this has huge implications on uh, consumption, uh, production. In a recent study, uh, Professor Fu Ningzhong, who is in the audience, found China's food consumption has been rather constant despite rapid economic growth. He argued that changing energy need as a result of aging population is one key factor. But here I want to add one more explanation. I think maybe the marriage market squeeze also has uh, some uh, explanations. We think about when people spend more money on status goods, visible goods, they will have to spend less on invisible consumption, such as food, because no neighbors want, don't know what you eat at home. So this maybe also explains this testable hypothesis. On the supply uh, production side, also I think there are some uh, consequences. When I was in the field a couple of years ago, I talked to quite many young women and men, most of them treat uh, agriculture production as a stigma. So n young men young don't want to work in the farm. So right now there's a big issue. The, look at the working force in the agriculture sector, mostly elderly men, over 60 years old, 50 years old. I think about down the road, 20 years, 30 years, there's a lost generation of farmers 
with the kind of farming skills, with their implication for China's uh, food production and road, so they also deserve more uh, research. Also, there's uh, some impact on Latin America and other countries, because China's fixed uh, investment uh, money, partly driven by the increasing sex racial imbalance, means more demand for raw materials from Latin America. And uh, so this was uh, very important to look at that. And the general uh, demographic change uh, means a lot of uh, transition down the road. Professor Cai Fang, who is the most, most influential uh, expert in this area, has shown that China has entered a new paradigm of labor shortage. The population uh, dividend has run out. As a result, you will see rising wage rate. There's an increasing report on labor shortage in the manufacturing sector. Actually, this reduced China's competitiveness in the international market, but also partly reduced the pressures for uh, re-evaluate Chinese currency. So we need to look at this factor when discussing the exchange rate policy. Also, whether China will shift its manufacturing base to other countries also deserve uh, close watch. So overall, I think Latin American countries and other countries should pay close attention to China's demographic change and the policies. So what happened with, in China will be affected in other countries. That's as Professor Edwards said, China is too big to be ignored. It's a big elephant in the room. Thank you. <laughs>